name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> and we'll ask our Blessed Lady, Mother of the Church, who herself was a refugee along with Joseph and Jesus, to pray for us. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady, Queen of Peace, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Thank you so much, um, Bishop Paul, for doing this prayer with this short notice. Um, it's a really, way, a really lovely way to start the meeting. Um, so today we're going to uh, follow the format, the Sea Judge Act format. Uh, some of you might be familiar with that. Um, so we're going to start with Sophie, who's going to go through the C part and who's going to tell us more about what we see, um, focusing on the new immigration plan. Um, I'm just quickly going to introduce her. Um, Sophie is the new, uh, is the senior policy officer at Jera S UK. She has an academic background in theology and previously worked with people seeking asylum in Glasgow. Um, Sophie, thank you so much for coming and the flow is yours. Uh, thanks, thanks so much. Hi everyone. Um, yes, okay, so I'm going to uh, talk about um, the new government proposals for um, asylum, which are laid out in its new plan for immigration. Uh, and um, I'm also going to talk uh, at this context there's a bit about JRS UK's new report on the asylum system. But first, let's just very briefly touch on the asylum system uh, as it currently is. Um, this will give useful context, I hope. So refugees who arrive in the UK on their own steam, of course, have to navigate a complex process before the government will recognise them as refugees. They are routinely faced with suspicion and with disbelief. Uh, and the people who uh, decide on their claim um, are often effectively looking for reasons to refuse them. Um, uh, and whilst they're waiting for a decision, um, they're banned from working or claiming benefits and they have to live on approximately five pounds a day. That's if they can get asylum support, which can be very difficult to access. Once people are refused, they end up destitute and at risk of detention. Um, that is actually where JRS meets them. We have a special ministry to people detained um, for immigration purposes and people who have been made destitute by the asylum system. People face a really hostile environment and they can struggle for years just to get the justice that they need, just to get protection. Um, and repeatedly, the people that we accompany and serve uh, tell them that this is profoundly dehumanizing. They were forced to flee their homes and they came here wanting sanctuary. Instead, they were re-traumatized. Um, and uh, years of enforced idleness and exclusion really erodes people's sense of self. Destitution leaves people vulnerable to exploitation. Um, detention, that's indefinite incarceration in prison-like conditions um, under immigration powers, is actually particularly crushing. Um, I've so frequently heard torture survivors describing it as torture. So it's clear that already our society has lost sight of human dignity in our approach to asylum. Um, and we need to, to put human dignity back at the heart of our response to asylum seekers. Um, and, and actually the refugees that we work with um, accordingly express a desire for justice um, and for a system that's for their good. Um, and so in a new report called Being Human in the Asylum System, we imagine what that might look like. We try to imagine a, a just and a person-centered system. Now, um, we've released this report at the same time um, that the government is planning to overhaul the asylum system. Um, it has made some proposals that it published in March. Um, there are some policy developments already underway uh, and um, we're expecting imminently um, a bill to come out in Parliament. Um, the, the changes the government proposes uh, and, and is beginning in some ways to implement 
are grossly unjust. They create barriers to protection and um, they actually deny the right of sanctuary seekers to claim asylum. Uh, we're trying to offer an alternative vision, an alternative narrative. Um, now, I'll sketch out key concerns with the government plans and approach in a minute. Um, turning very briefly to our report, this draws on research that we've done with refugees over the last three years. Um, now, this includes reports um, by Dr. Anna Rollins uh, called For Our Welfare and Not For Our Harm. Um, uh, and the, the report that we've done now brings refugee experience into conversation with Catholic social thought. And really, we did this because we wanted to ask what principles should we start with when we're building an asylum system? Um, you know, what should government policy and what should law on asylum be aiming to do? And um, perhaps unsurprisingly, we found that Catholic social thought has some really striking implications for our thinking about asylum. It challenges us to reorient our thinking about border management so that we're thinking about it uh, in terms of common humanity and human need. It requires us, of course, to protect and to nurture human dignity. Um, and it reminds us that the common good can only be achieved if everyone is participating. And th th that really means including the most marginalized. Um, and it calls us to create structures with and for others in solidarity with the most marginalized. Um, so drawing together these principles and reflections from refugees and asylum seekers, we recommend core principles for a radically reformed asylum system. Okay, so here's the, the core principles that we would like to see. Um, first, enshrine protection and transparency at the heart of the asylum determination process. Um, and do this in a culture where asylum claimants are seen and where they're heard. So the asylum system is meant to be for extending protection to people who need it. In order to do this, it must focus on ensuring that people can easily access that protection um, and not, as so many of the government proposals do, on creating further barriers. It needs to offer justice and openness, and it needs to be navigable, easy to understand, um, open to engagement um, with the people seeking sanctuary. It needs to really listen to asylum seekers and want to understand them. So that's enshrining protection and transparency in asylum determination. Two, provide borders which are open to those in need of protection. Um, CST suggests that the Earth's resources are for everyone. And to be just, migration management has to account for this. Um, this moves us away from a defensive approach to migrants and refugees, which pits our good against theirs. It moves us away from a, a narrative of um, threat uh, um, and to, to think about human kinship. Um, okay, and then Three, support for asylum claimants and refugees to live in dignity and participate fully in wider social, economic and political life. Um, repeatedly, we heard from refugees a desire for community, for recognition of hu their humanity and for the chance to spend time well. This, respects, this reflects the central importance of participation in CSD and um, the conviction that people are made for and flourish in community. Um, we really concretely actually heard about a desire to be able to work. Um, now, that is something that um, people seeking asylum are banned from doing in the UK. Uh, and that is one core recommendation we'd really like to change. Um, so that's um, support for asylum claimants to live in dignity and participate. And, and fourth, we want to foster a society that welcomes, protects, promotes, and integrates those seeking sanctuary as our neighbors. Um, the current asylum system uh, greets asylum seekers and migrants with hostility. Um, and uh, we want to do something differently. Um, now, 
this suggests that indeed reform is really badly needed. Unfortunately, um, the government's new plan for immigration is not it. Um, to be blunt, it runs directly counter to the principles um, that have uh, that, that we've drawn out in um, in our report, um, and uh, it really should be of deep deep concern to the church and to everyone who cares about human dignity. Now, um, the details of these plans um, are still um, not entirely clear. They're being drawn up. Um, uh, as I've mentioned already, um, a, a few of um, the key points um, are already being put into policy. Um, uh, there's new rules that, that uh, came in in January. Um, that are part of what the government's talking about is new plan for immigration, but a lot will uh, go um, before Parliament in a bill that we expect to be happening next month, well, to, to start out next month. Um, so more details will emerge and, um, uh, you know, we, we can respond to them as they come, um, but uh, the government has laid out their, their intentions um, in with um, the publication in March of their new plan for immigration. Um, and uh, our core concerns are, well, first and foremost, under these new plans, how you got to the UK will determine how worthy of protection you are. Um, so crudely, if someone has traveled via another country or without documents, they will face additional barriers to even getting their claim heard. Um, this is something that's starting to happen already um, under uh, new rules on inadmissibility that uh, came in in January. Um, and um, we at JRS are already aware of people who have um, asked for asylum and been told, uh, we're considering you for, for inadmissibility. We might try to remove you to any other safe country, uh, and um, then they haven't heard anything else. It's 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 just um, creating further delays, uncertainty, and holding up the process. Um, and what's going to happen under new proposed legislation, even once the government has recognised that someone is a refugee, that is, even if um, uh, they do ultimately look at someone's claim and they say, yes, you need international protection, it will give them a lesser form of protection status. They won't be able to settle in the UK, they won't have access to public funds routinely, and they'll find it much, much harder to reunite with family. This is horrendous. Several experts have suggested, suggested that it actually contravenes the Refugee Convention. Um, let's be clear that most people seeking sanctuary have no choice about how they travel. Um, and they're not obliged under the Refugee Convention to seek asylum in the first apparently safe country. In fact, if they did, global provision for refugees would be impossible. Um, very few countries would host the vast majority. This already happens to a large extent. Um, government proposals, uh, rather than treating that as something that needs to, to be resolved and, and with which the global community needs that support would make this worse. Um, and relatively few people come to Britain um, and they normally have clear reasons for doing so, like family ties. To penalise people for how they got here um, is dishonest about the reality of forced migration and abandons the principle of international protection. It's, it's being described as firm but fair, but it is anything but. Um, second, asylum seekers will be housed in basic reception centres while they are, await an answer on their claims. Now, um, think here Napier Barracks, um, which it, uh, we think these basic reception centres are likely to resemble. Um, and uh, JRS UK is actually currently supporting people in Napier Barracks. I was there about a month ago um, and 
it's bleak. It's prison-like. Um, it's removed uh, from the community, so, so people are ghettoized. Um, and people, uh, they really struggle to access healthcare, um, to access solicitors. So this is really bad for um, engagement with asylum cases. It doesn't actually make sense if what you want is a, an efficient and just asylum system. Um, people are often cold, so they don't, often don't get enough to eat. And um, sleep deprivation in, in this um, context where there's no privacy at all um, is a really, really big problem. Um, someone uh, we know who was previously accommodated there told us, I didn't feel like a person when I was there. I felt I'd lost who I was, like my personality had gone. And the use of reception centres runs directly counter to any approach based on integration. Um, you know, if someone is living in a flat in the community, they have neighbours, um, they have organic opportunities to connect with people. Um, and this just doesn't allow um, people seeking asylum to participate in communities or to build wider social bonds. So that, that's perception centres, which I think are a very big problem. Um, third, several measures make it harder uh, for people to share evidence relevant to their asylum claim if they didn't do so immediately. Um, uh, and this would make it very difficult for people to get a, a fair hearing of fresh asylum claims. We work with a lot of people who've been let down by this, the asylum system and they have to pursue fresh claims before finally having been rec being recognised as having been refugees all along. Um, they face so many barriers before they can rebuild their lives and the government's proposals would make it even harder for them. Um, it's important to be clear that there are a lot of good reasons that people bring evidence after making an initial claim. Um, the system uh, for claiming asylum is technical, it's complex and it's difficult to navigate and at first people may not understand what's relevant, they may not get legal advice um, in time because it's there is a shortage of, of, of legal aid providers. Um, uh, so that it, it's not always clear to people what they need to provide. And then often the things that are most relevant to an asylum claim and, and why someone needs um, international protection are profoundly traumatic. They're really hard to talk about, um, particularly um, in a uh, formal and quite adversarial setting, which um, an asylum interview often is. Um, it's also just very, very difficult often to get all of the evidence you need from another country, which you probably fled in haste. Um, so there's just so many reasons um, for, for bringing um, evidence um, uh, after making an initial claim. Um, and in failing to recognise this, again, um, the government proposals are ignoring basic Human realities. Um, there, there's a there's a cruelty without um, any measure of, of realism or practicality in them. Um, so that's making it harder for people to share evidence um, after they made an initial claim um, or additional evidence. Um, fourth, and connected to this, a lot of measures within the proposals formalise and deepen a hermeneutic of suspicion. Um, crucially, um, they suggest using a higher standard of proof um, when assessing uh, an asylum seeker's credibility um, and the, trying to assess whether they're afraid of returning to their country of origin. Now, um, this will simply place an unrealistic burden of proof um, on, uh, on something it's just inherently hard to prove uh, and where the consequences of refusing someone incorrectly um, are catastrophic because they put human lives at risk. Um, in reality, people already face a wall of disbelief. Um, in uh, a report being human, uh, you can see the case of Cecile, uh, a refugee we've um, supported. She was refused asylum because she couldn't 
remember the exact date on which something happened. She then had to struggle for a decade before being granted protection. Um, and her case is really not untypical. Um, you can read more about her experience in the report. Um, so this is not a context in which you need or <laughs> want policies that virtually tell home office case workers not to believe people, but that's what's happening. Um, rather than countering the culture of this belief, um, they deepen it. Okay. Um, now, fifth, um, proposals include the introduction of an expedited process for claims and appeals made from detention. Now, what exactly does this mean? Well, you may be aware that previously there was a detained fast track process. So this means that immediately on claiming asylum, people would be detained. That means being put in something that is basically prison. Um, and the case would be rushed through and they're in detention. Um, this process was actually ruled illegal by the courts because the asylum process that it yielded was so unjust. Um, in uh, our report, Being Human, um, Joel, a refugee, shares his experience of um, being on the detention fast track. Um, I've actually spoken uh, to Joel a lot about his experience myself in it, and it's horrible. Um, he claimed asylum, he was immediately detained, um, and his case was summarily refused. Uh, he then remained in detention for many more months, um, was ultimately released, uh, and now, six years later, he's just been recognised as a refugee. Um, he spent a lot of that six years, once he was released from detention, in destitution. That system stole six years of his life. Um, and it did that to so many people that the courts ruled it to be illegal. The new plan for immigration suggests resurrecting it. Um, this is accompanied by a move away from um, any wider thinking about alternatives to detention, and away from um, talk of reducing the detention estate, you might be aware that a new detention centre is being built in County Dublin. Um, suggestions have also been mooted for um, offshore detention. We hope that this will be um, not uh, happening immediately, but uh, it's a possibility. Um, and uh, everywhere that this has uh, been attended internationally, it has been catastrophic. Um, so uh, we, we are concerned about that, and it's more to just flag that as a possibility. So um, this isn't an exhaustive list or analysis of the new plan for immigration. Uh, and as I say, it's still unfolding. Um, but I hope it gives an idea of what is so troubling. Some things. Um, that you might want to um, focus on if you are moved, as I hope you are, to uh, engage on this, um, particularly as the bill uh, comes before Parliament. Um, okay, uh, I think there will at some point be an opportunity for questions, but um, that's, um, that's me for now. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Sophie, for giving this really detailed explanation and for telling, telling us more about the asylum sy system and the immigration plan and how it should look like. Um, and like you said, uh, proposals, proposals are irrelevant to the real needs and you said that it create barriers. And I think I read somewhere that the word illegal appears almost 80 times um, in the plan and having that contrast of illegal versus safe and legal route is totally not fair as asylum seekers and refugees have no choice in the route they're taking. Um, and I think we all agree that we want a fair and asylum system that hears their stories and um, allows them to flourish and rebuild their lives. And like you said, build, put their dignity first. Um, and with this network, we should really take this opportunity to work together as we're stronger together to do so. Um, if you have any questions, you can write them down, down and there will be some time um, later, uh, if that's okay. Now we're going to move to the judge part um, in which we reflect on how we feel about it and what we think about it. Um, and Bishop Paul is going to uh, lead us in a reflection.
Thank you. Thank you, Venus. Thank you very much, Sophie, for your presentation. The government had a consultation period on its new plan for immigration. And the plan was presented as the government's intentions to build what it called a fair but firm asylum and illegal immigration system. Not only the word illegal, but the word fair appeared a number of times in the document as well. So Catholic Charities, JRS, the Bishop's Conference, CSAN, SVP, many Catholic Charities responded to the consultation, but none of them agreed that the new plan was fair. In fact, it is believed that it is the opposite, unfair and unjust. How did we come to that conclusion? And that, of course, is what we are looking at in this judge section. One of the principles of Catholic social teaching is the preferential option for the poor, which means we need always to keep in mind how any decision might impact upon the poor. It also means, as Pope Francis says, to put the poor at the centre of our thinking. An immigration system which opens the doors only to the highly skilled by operating a points-based system reverses that principle to favour those who have wealth and wish to increase it. Those in need are rejected as it is believed that they have nothing to contribute, something that in fact is very untrue. Secondly, the new plan is regarded as unfair as this discrimination is compounded by differentiating according to the method of arrival in this country. The new plan treats those who risked their lives in coming here because they had no other choice in the way they did from those who are selected for safe arrival. Catholic social teaching also states that every person must be treated with equal care, equal compassion, equal dignity. All are made in the image of God. They are all refugees, all fleeing for whatever reason. The new plan says we'll accept some of them and we will reject others. And a very important point on the reopened community sponsorship scheme is that there are no target figures. We do not know how many the government intends to allow to come here under the reopened scheme. The new plan is presented as a means of removing people smugglers from the scenario. In fact, the new barriers will actually probably increase refugees being put into the arms of people smugglers and traffickers. People compelled to make unsafe journeys are exposed to greater risks of harm and abuse. When there are no safe and legal routes, other routes become necessary. And worst of all, worst of all, some refugees have been mistakenly identified as smugglers and prosecuted. And any plan should ensure that victims are never criminalized. Bishop William Kenney, in his submission on the new plan, said, across the world, it has been consistently demonstrated that policies criminalizing those seeking sanctuary and introducing new border security measures do not save lives, but is simply a charter for trafficking. The new plan speaks also of what it calls reception centers, which sounds very nice, a reception center which will provide basic accommodation. And as Sophie mentioned, you will have heard of Napier Barracks, which was used as such a center. It transpired that it wasn't fit for human habitation. Upon arrival in this country, what the basic need is, is that those refugees are provided with nothing less than what will affirm 
and not undermine their human dignity. Another principle of Catholic social teaching. Rather, and Sophie mentioned this as well, rather than being welcomed in the new plan, they will be subject to an investigation to establish two things, that they are who they say they are, which will be impossible. If you're fleeing a war situation, you don't stop to bring your documents with you. Secondly, you will have to show that they are experiencing a genuine fear of persecution. To me, this shows a misunderstanding as to why people flee in the first place. It may be because of persecution. It may be because of war. Then we might ask, who supplied the weapons for that war? What country was involved in arms dealing? They may have fled because they can no longer sustain themselves due to climate change. Industrialized nations are responsible for rising temperatures which affect the planet. One of the great principles which Pope Francis has advanced is that of interdependence. Everything is connected, he says. When people flee their country, is it possible? And this is part of the judge sec section. One of the questions we should ask, is it possible that we were somehow involved in creating those conditions which influenced their decision to flee? In the gospel, we are told that our blessed lady pondered everything in her heart. One translation has it, she put everything together. On making a judgment about the new plan for immigration, one can look at what is immediately before us, refugees seeking shelter, and address that question, which we should do. We can also be bolder and ask, how did this happen? Are we somehow responsible for this situation? What is clear from the scriptures and from Catholic social teaching is that we are our brothers and sisters keeper responsible for their well-being. It is our obligation to protect them. We can't simply close our borders and think of ourselves. Fratelli Tutti presents the ideal of universal fraternity. With the new plan for immigration, we do the opposite. We isolate ourselves. Self-preservation and self-interest is its goal. It doesn't take the global situation into account. So it is up to us to ask these questions and make a judgment. For the immediate, what is needed is concern for those who are attempting to find a safe haven. We need to advocate on their behalf. At the same time, we need to ask and encourage others to ask, why are there refugees? and those who are seeking asylum in the first place? And the answer to that question is not what many would suspect, nor indeed what some of the media want us to believe. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Bishop Paul, for this reflection. It really links um, to what Sophia said previously and uh, your importance to welcome and provide support to those who are seeking protection and not do the opposite. Um, so thank you again. Uh, now we're going to move on uh, to the call for actions um, because we've seen, we've judged and reflected on how we feel and what we think. So now it's time to act. And before we go into breakout rooms, uh, Mariel is going to tell us more about the call for actions. Uh, you're on mute, uh, Mariel. On mute. Sorry about that. Uh, you think I'd have got it sorted by now? Um, okay, well, thank you. Two extremely powerful speakers there. Thank you so much. Um, what, what the benefit of bringing everybody together, I've, we've tried to get as many people from different organisations together to hear this, 
because I think it's really important that we get behind these experts. So um, JRS have, have, have put a huge amount of resource behind this. Um, so I think we should look to them as our guides for how to respond. Um, and the particular response that I'm calling for this network is, you know, let's get behind this. We're, we are a lot more informed now and through um, sharing uh, the report and reading it in detail, um, how we can get together. So what I'm asking, um, and you can discuss this in, in the breakout rooms afterwards, is um, can everybody, um, and we'll send this out as well, join the Together with Refugees Coalition. So that's bringing, up, bringing everybody together so everybody is stronger together and uh, uh, ready to uh, work together and to be informed together. So that's the first call. The second one is, as you've seen and as you've heard in the report from JRS, it's all about um, personalising stories, you know, understanding that these are people, they're not, um, the, the um, immigration plan is all about dehumanising and making it all about them, but we want to individualise into the individual knowns. We heard from Joel and others that in the report. So you are working with refugees, please, you know, obviously with their permission um, and just share their stories. Um, and there's the hashtag that lots of organizations are coming together to use that. So that's who we are. The third one is, is just join the lobbying as the bill goes through parliament. So um, Sophie has already said, and she's offered a template to write to your MPs, but please, um, and I hope Sophie will keep us informed as, as, we, as the bill goes through and we can communicate that out, but please you know, join us to uh, lobby the bill as it goes through Parliament, informed by GRS. So that, that, those are the main things. Okay, thank you. I'll pass back to Inez and then uh, we'll be going into uh, breakout rooms. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mariel. And uh, yes, like you said, we're so much stronger together, especially within the next few months that are crucial in terms of how we welcome refugees or as changes go um, through Parliament. Um, so now we're going into breakout rooms for, I think, approximately 15 minutes, depending on the timings, to discuss about how this might apply to you and your project. And you, if you have any questions for Sophie and Bishop Paul um, about how you can take part. Um, so we're going to put some questions in the chat. Um, the, I'm going to read them uh, right now so you have an idea. What struck you from the two speakers? What stories can you share? Can you see any barriers to getting behind the lobbying? And if you have any questions um, to the speakers, we'll put them in the chat um, and we'll see you in 15 minutes. And there will be some time for feedback after. So if you can designate someone to uh, do the feedback. Thank you. what they talked about in the breakout rooms, or if they have any questions for the speakers. Yes, Alessandra. Thank you, Ines, I don't mind going first. Um, we said that the Sophie did a, a really good job at summarizing what the new plan for immigration actually is about. Um, it, it was a really long document with probably 15 or 20 or more proposals. Obviously, we don't really know how many of those are going to make it into the bill, the borders bill once it's introduced, but we, we thought she did a really good job at summarising what some of the main points are, what some of the main issues are. And leading on from that, what we were talking about is how we need to be, be really, as a, I guess, informal coalition of campaigners, really strategic and really tactical when it comes to the advocacy. So once the bill is introduced, we need to be very clear about what is it that we're trying to, to change to tackle. Realistically, we won't be able to influence every single point. We know we won't, unfortunately. We know how set this government is on these reforms. So we have to be really clear now and really strategic on which are the specific points we're going to try and influence so when it comes to the, the second reading or, or the right time we'll be able to to um to influence and, and to put pressure on MPs to table specific amendments so we we're talking about how we need to be 
yeah, quite, quite tactical rather than just talking about changing the asylum system because that doesn't really mean anything um, to the public, especially. So, so are we doing that through this meeting? You know, are, you know will um, Sophie, you'll help guide us through that? And will, you know, is it, or are you doing something yourself um, with SVP, Alessandra? Where do we take the lead from? Um, I mean, I'm not sure how Sophie and, you know, let, let Sophie obviously, you know, is FIFA DRF. I mean, from the SVP, we're, it's a hard question, to be honest, and I don't have a specific answer for it now. I feel it's one of those things where different organisations will have different priorities. Some will focus on detention, some will focus on unaccompanied asylum seeking children. And it's quite, I think, in the, in the Christian space, there, there isn't maybe, um, uh, you know, a, a coordinated approach as such, or there hasn't been until now. So maybe this is an opportunity for us to develop that. And that doesn't mean that there is one organization that says, you know, we are the leader and we, you know, we would give you the information. But I think that there needs to be maybe a little bit more, more joined up thinking in terms of how that takes place. I'm not quite sure yet. We're working on our own, you know, the priorities in terms of which are the two, three maximum points that will focus on in terms of lobbying and peace, you know, asking them, this is what we want you to focus on. Um, and that, that decision is based on what, what we think is realistic, achievable, um, as opposed to what is the easier win, if you will. Um, so in terms of who to look to, look to I'm not sure. Maybe <laughs> Sophie can, can say a bit more. Maybe this is the space where we decide. Um, I'm not sure. Sophie? Um, okay, yeah. Um, thanks, Alessandra, because I think that's, it's, it's a really good point that we, that we need to sort of be specific. I suppose um, one thing is that we need to do more than one thing here. There is specific lobbying um, on, on the bill um, and um, uh, different bits of legislation there. And then, you know, it's, it's obviously good to be pretty specific about what you're um, asking your MP to do, or at least what, what you're objecting to. Um, and I, I can share with you, well, to, to, to be honest, the, the bits that I've focused on most of the, the, the new plan are, um, it won't surprise you, sort of accord with um, JRS's working priorities that could shift as we, we find out more. But, um, okay, if, if you wanted just a suggestion for, for one thing, um, the, the proposal to differentiate asylum claims on the basis of how people got here, it's just, it really does, it's potentially taking us outside of the refugee convention. It abandons the very, principle of, of asylum almost. So if, if anyone wants a suggestion, obviously you all have your own priorities, um, that might might be a place to start. Um, yeah, I, I think that there's kind of a, a need to um, be a bit specific when talking uh, to MPs about the bill and thinking about amendments. Um, and in a sense, it's a bit difficult to hone that process too much for the bill comes. There is, I think, also a need to create wider narrative change. Um, you know, we are presented with a narrative um, where uh, we're told that, that everyone is gaming the system, um, where somehow bizarrely um, victims of modern slavery are seen as, as a threat that we need to guard against so that we make it more difficult for them to get support. And we need also to offer a, a counter narrative um, and cultural um, change. Um, I think part of that is that this is a space in which um, I suspect that grassroots and local campaigning and, and, and for example for the church, local parishes, but also um, bishops looking at things happening in their own diocese can have a particular impact, for example, um, if more reception centres open up, well, what about the local community there um, and, and their response? Um, am I is that at all helpful? No, uh, at the moment, um, you're in, in the lead, um, Sophie, in terms of, you know, this group, we, we're listening to you and we're being guided by you with your reports. Now, obviously, Alessandra, 
you know, we, you feed in what you're doing as well. And if we can, if we can all get behind the same three key points, then that would be so much more powerful. But it does depend how it goes through Parliament. You know, mm -hmm. it might it, there might be um, changes that have been made as a result of the consultation. So let's let's keep together and keep talking, and we will inform this group and all the members of this group to uh, get behind it and, and behind what you say uh, is best. And also, Erin uh, was in my breakout group from the Catholic Union, um, so it'd be good to uh, involve Erin uh, uh, as well. That would be good to be part of that. Okay. Thank you. Any more comments or questions? Yeah, Silvana. And then Julianne. Just just to report back from from my group, I suppose just three things. Um, I mean, one was a sense of urgency. You know that it really does feel urgent that we need to be lobbying, however we do it, whoever we do it with, and you know whatever. Just that we sort of need to be getting on with it. Um, the importance of personal contact. I think people talked about their their contacts with people having heard stories which has led them to understand as perhaps something they hadn't understood whatever so so just that whole thing about the contact and the personal stories and then the other thing which in a way seemed like a no-brainer to us but you know obviously not was that 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 explicit link with um, catholic social teaching um to do with dignity and participation and dignity of work and just about every principle of Catholic social teaching being undermined through the um, asylum system. The fact that there's this broad message which is for all Catholics and not just the ones who are interested enough to turn up at meetings. Um, all Catholics should be passionate about this because it's actually undermining something that's a principle of our faith. So that was just from us. But how do we get all Catholics passionate? It's another matter. So, yeah. Thank you very much, Silvana. Uh, I think Judy Ann had her hand up and then Petula. Oh, you're on mute. There we go. Thank you. Um, I'll try and be quick. Uh, so, just uh, cutting, I suppose, to the chase, uh, we talked also about uh, what we need to do, and it's a big job going to the MP, um, in, well, dealing with Parliament, period. And I'm uh, speaking for Safe Passage, and I don't know if people there are acquainted with us, but we've had a lot of um, experience in dealing with Parliament. We, took, uh, we were able to get the women and children out of detention. And so we're really wanting to work with other people in a group. And I agree with um, Alessandra and Sophie that it seems like it should be a cooperative as opposed to one single thing. And I think pretty much it looks to me like everybody is agreeing on the uh, three different points. Um, on the chat here, I've seen that we, were, we have three different model letters, which is really good because then the MP aren't just getting just a single stock letter. They'll have multiple choice. <laughs> and I think the more that we can think in terms of working as a whole, the better it's going to be and the more power it gives us. And I also think that we should be bringing in um, uh, the Muslims and uh, their different um, charities because so far I haven't heard much of that. And that would be like a weak point in the interfaith alliance. Does that make sense? Okay, and then what we also talked about was that we had um, the Harrow Food Bank. They are giving out vouchers and are willing to help that way, but mostly um, it was focusing in on the barriers to lobbying. Thank you. Um, Petula, I think you had your hand up. Yes. Yes, uh, my question's been answered, actually. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, are there any more questions? Yes, Lourdes? You're on mute. That's good because I talk a lot. 
<laughs> the thing is, I, I appreciate uh, what's your name? Of, was it? Uh, yeah, the lady who spoke about barriers. It came in my mind that we should have interfaith. And it is important because Catholic doesn't divide. We are human beings. Everybody's a child of God. And that's why I said 100%. One is that. Second, it, because I work with youngsters, I told you I will work with young offenders. And I've seen children, young, young persons, to be politically correct, <laughs> young persons in the, uh, in the young offenders, you know, who are refugees and the, this unaccompanied children, what are we doing? Are we trying to reunite them? We have to go on that. Go on, Ned, I'll, I'll listen to you, yes. That is as, uh, very important. How will they communicate and reuniting? Because a lot of the children, uh, young persons I met are lost, don't have real models because they have lost out on their parenting uh, roles, which are supposed to be played. Please go ahead. I'm sorry, I'll stop now. Me? Yeah, you go ahead. Okay. Yeah, that. Oh, that's one of the things that Safe Passage works on is going to be a family reunification. And, that's and as we knew before Brexit, we had the Dub scheme, the Dublin scheme, and then also the government scheme. And now all of that's out of the window. And so things are moving very fast. But part of the interfaith action is that um, we'd like to really work with everybody else and are hopefully uh, going to be presenting something in the autumn. And it would be really great if there, we, we already have a letter that we used from um, in 2020 that was very successful. And we'd like to put that on the table and have everybody else take a look at it and do and add bits and pieces. Thank you. And Thank, you. I, Thank you. I I definitely will get in touch with you. <laughs> and I speak a few Asian languages and a bit of German too. So I understand a little bit about humanity. Thank you very much, everybody, um, for your input. Unfortunately, time is passing by and I know we could keep going for hours. Um, but still in the ACT part, we're going to move on to Nick, who's going to tell us more about a new befriending project that JRS started. Um, so Nick is the Community Outreach Officer at the Jesuit Refugee Service UK. His role involves raising awareness of the situation the refugee friends of JRS face in the UK, helping share their stories and engaging the wider church community in the mission to accompany refugees and forcibly displaced people. Um, thank you so much, Nick, and the floor is yours. Thanks, Ines. Um, yeah, I think it's been um, a really, really lovely um, gathering today, actually, and, and provides me with a lot of hope for um, the group of people we have here that will uh, hopefully fight some of the things that are, that are coming up. Um, but as Sophie has already um, explained, she sort of looked at some of the advocacy stuff that we, we do at JRS. And our mission at JRS is to advocate for refugees, but it's also to accompany and serve them. Um, so I just wanted to share a little bit of, of one of the projects that we started um, since the pandemic began, which is a volunteer befrienders scheme. Um, so this was, was started right really at the start of the, uh, the pandemic as we moved away from the model that we had of meeting at our day centre and um, basically doing everything from there, um, at least with our work with destitute refugees. Um, and we realised that we had to do something to, to sort of as the day since closed, to still meet the, the sort of the pastoral and emotional support that we that we offer to our refugee friends uh, from a distance. Um, so the Befrienders project started really, it's quite simple in it in its aims, it's to, to combat isolation and um, to allow people to, to, to befriend one another. You know, we call the people who we accompany at JRS our friends and we like to think that it's not just a title or a way of referring to them, that actually it's a, it's a fact that we do get to know people for who they are and get to know their likes, their dislikes, their favourite football teams, what music they like to, to dance to, all those kind of things that make us who we are. And so this scheme essentially pairs uh, a refugee uh, with a volunteer um, and they will call each other once a week. Um, sometimes it can be quite a short call, uh, a quick sort of check-in, how are you doing, um, you know, 
other times people speak for a long period of time and I've heard from some of our volunteers who speak sometimes to some refugee friends for up to an hour you know they've really gotten to know each other very well um, and it's been a great source of support firstly just as I say combat in isolation um, making sure people felt there was there was somebody they could talk to during the pandemic and uh, I think this worked both ways as well it wasn't just for the refugees that we uh, accompany, but actually for the volunteers themselves, you know, when you're not seeing your friends and family as much as you're used to, having somebody uh, that you can call uh, and check in with on a regular basis is, was, was great for them. Um, and I think it also fed into our work as well in the sense that uh, over the course of a longer conversation, you can obviously get to understand there might be something that's a bit less obvious or that's under the surface that's um, affecting one of our refugee friends and the sort of thing our staff and volunteers uh, would have picked up on quite naturally in the day centre when they had a chance and time to, to speak with people in, in person that maybe you wouldn't miss on a, on a, a shorter call when everyone was working remotely um, and so people were able then to feed back other things to the other services that we were providing and, and allow our staff team who are, you know, have that, uh, that, that training and support to be able to do the casework follow up that was necessary. So it was really effective during the, the pandemic, but it's something that we really want to continue beyond the pandemic. So it can be done from home, over the phone or via Zoom, depending on people's um, preferences. And we're hoping that as sort of restrictions lift and um, as it becomes um, possible that we might be able to do more in person as well, should volunteers and refugees find that helpful and that be agreeable. So our volunteers usually work with, uh, make between five and 10 calls a week, depending on their availability. Um, and over the course of the past year, we've had 28 volunteers involved, 131 refugee friends uh, involved in the scheme as well. I think uh, the, the stats when I had them worked out to about, th it was 3,288 phone calls. Um, so you just see the practical difference that makes and the points of connection that's built. Um, obviously the sort of people that we're looking for really are just people who are good listeners, good conversationalists, who have empathy um, and want to get to know refugees. We've talked here about the importance of welcome and integration and, um, you know, a big part of that is actually just being able to form friendships with people. Um, obviously, some people use it as well as a way of learning English and building their confidence with their conversation skills as well. Of course, if you do speak other languages, then that's great. Uh, it can help those refugees whose English isn't isn't so good. Um, but we just basically ask that, re that our volunteers commit to a period of about three months of making the calls just to allow that continuity and to allow relationships to develop as well. And um, so you can find out more on our website or, of course, on the, the Caritas Volunteer, Volunteering Service website as well. There should be information on there. Uh, but I'd also just like, if I, if I may, just to mention our at-home hosting scheme. Um, we've talked about the impact of um, the new changes to immigration, um, but also we you know we know the destitute asylum seekers and refused asylum seekers that we work with uh, have been facing um, homelessness for long periods of time. Um, during the pandemic, we had people um, accommodated under various uh, schemes to get people off the streets during the pandemic, but these are coming to a close. Uh, and our at-home scheme is basically a way of hosting refugees who are known to us at JRS, so they're already registered with us uh, in the Greater London area, three-month placements with volunteer hosts. Um, so it can be that we have a wide range of people who do it. We have religious communities, we have um, single people we have families who host um, and really it's a great way of if you have a spare room of offering hospitality and welcome in a very radical way i think and quite countercultural, allowing somebody into your home and really witnessing to the sort of things that we've been talking about in our faith um, but i i ask particularly because we're in real need of hosts at the moment because of the, the sort of the way things are at the moment with um alternative provision coming to an end with um, changes with the um, some of the religious communities that we that we work in, obviously some some communities have older residents and aren't been, haven't been able to host um, as with people who are shielding, for example. We've also had people who now have been hosting for a long period during the pandemic and are well, I would hoping to to take a break. Others who perhaps are, are travelling to go and see family and friends and so aren't able to host for a short period, but it's left us in the position where actually there are a few people who are currently hosted who have been hosted for some time, who we don't actually have a placement lined up for. 
And at the moment, there isn't really an alternative other than to, to help them try and find a homeless shelter and they'll face a return back to that insecure accommodation after so long in the scheme. Um, so we're in particular need of, of, all, of, all, of all hosts, but particularly those who might be able to host men. And um, we're, we're struggling to find placements for men at the moment. So if you have a spare room in London, great, get in touch. But particularly if you can help us get the, the word out as well and spread that message because we really are in desperate need. And um, so I'll post my email address. If you um, want to get into contact with me and find out how you might be able to help, please do that. And of course, as, as Ines said, my job is really at JRS is to go to parishes and schools and chaplaincies and talk about some of the issues that we've talked about today um, and I love the opportunity to do so so uh, if you have a, a parish group or you you want to energize your parish or your school and um, then please do let me know and I will hopefully be able to come and, and help you with that as much as I'm able anyway um, but thank you very much for, for listening to me and it's been lovely to, to be with you all today take care Thank you very much, Nick, um, for telling us about this new project. It really looks like a great support. And if any of you are interested, um, email Nick. I believe you'll put your email address in the in the chat, but we will also send the information uh, by email after this uh, meeting. Um, are there any questions? We might maybe have time for one. No. Okay, so before we wrap up this meeting and... Um, Bishop Paul uh, sends us in a blessing. I'm quickly going to share a video about the walk. I'm not sure if you heard about it, but uh, it's an international arts festival in support of refugees. And there's a big puppet called uh, Little Amal, which will be traveling 8,000 uh, kilometers across Turkey and Europe, and will be welcomed by hundreds of cultural events along the way. Um, Bishop Paul sent it to me this morning, and I think, correct me if I'm wrong, that we wish to welcome her to the cathedral on the 25th of October. Yes. Um, so I'm quickly going to uh, share my screen, and hopefully it will work. Uh, not sure. I'm not sure why it's not working. Um, then I'll just put the the link. Uh, do you see it? Yes, we can yes, see it. You yes. can full screen with it. Yes, just yeah. press play. Yeah. It's starting, but can't hear it. Oh, can now.
So I will send it, uh, send the video um, to after this meeting. Um, so apparently we hope to welcome her uh, to the cathedral on the 25th um, of October. Um, so this meeting almost comes to an end. Um, thank you so much for attending and we will send out the presentations, the summary of the breakout rooms, and I believe the recording too. Um, and we'll stay connected to act together on this, all these issues we talked about that is really important and really have to take this opportunity through this network uh, meeting. Um, Bishop, would you um, do a quick blessing for us, please? Lovely. Thank you very much, Ines, for today. We're very grateful for you bringing us together. And thank you to everyone on the gallery. Thank you to Sophie as well and everyone who contributed. Little Amal will be coming to Foxton, then going to Dover, then go to St. Paul's Cathedral, Westminster Cathedral, the Victoria and Albert Museum before going to Sheffield, Coventry, Birmingham, Manchester. And it is hoped that she will also go to COP26. So we'll conclude, first of all, with a little line from Pope Francis's message for this year's World Day for Migrants and Refugees. Pope Francis says, today's migration movements offer an opportunity for us to overcome our fears and let ourselves be enriched by the diversity of each person's gifts. Then, if we so desire, we can transform borders into privileged places of encounter, where the miracle of a never wider we can come about. So we pray for God's blessings upon all refugees. We pray especially for all refugees who today are on the move, looking for a place where they can call home. And we ask for God's blessings upon our own work, that it will bear fruit, that it will bear a rich harvest for the benefit of all refugees and those who are seeking asylum in this country. And may God's blessing come upon you and remain with us all forever. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you very much, Bishop Ball. And uh, we finished right on time. Um, so thank you for attending. And thank you to, all, to our speakers, Sophie and Nick. It was really useful and thank you. Um, we'll stay connected. And like I said, I will send you all the information uh, by email. It was really great to see you all. And I hope you have a great day, rest of the day. Thank you. And thanks Bye. so much to you, Inez. Thank you.